Welcome to Larger Tik. I'm your host, Dr. Raymond Chang. The other day, I was reading news and I saw this headline: it "says Taiwan U.S. ties are threatened." What ties? Was there ever even a tie? Well, of course, you might say. Well, there were the Taiwan Relations Act 1979 and the one in 2022. But putting aside all these things, and and let's try to be really objective. You see, you know, foreign affairs is all about being politically and economically practical with neighboring countries or countries around the world, isn't it? How well is the U.S. treating Taiwan? According to a recent news report from Taipei Times, U.S. President Joe Biden warned what well. well All chaos slipped, to be precise, about the destruction of Taiwan. Now that was after journalist Garland Nixon tweeted on February 16 this this month on his Twitter that, according to sources from the White House, when asked in quotes when asked if there could be any greater disaster than the new corn Ukraine project, President Biden responded, "Wait until you see our plan for the destruction of Taiwan." Now. Now the bombshell went viral on Taiwan social media platforms, leading to a huge wave of public outcry and wrath against U.S. politicians. And according to Taiwan's foreign affairs official, citizens of Taiwan should be cautious of sharing anything on social media that could lead to anti-U.S. sentiments. Why was that so? Now, was there not a tie? Where did the Taiwan Relations Act go? So what really happened? Why would Biden slip like that? Now this week we'll have a look at this. Now, according to the U.S. Congress website, the Taiwan Relations Act 1979 declares it to be the policy of the United States to preserve and promote extensive, close, and friendly commercial, cultural, and other relations between the people of the United States and the people in Taiwan, as well as the people on the China mainland and all other people of the Western Pacific area. The act declares that peace and stability of the area are in the political, security, and economic interests of the United States and other matters of international concern. Okay, so what the above means is that it is in the United States' interest that Taiwan is safe, at least. Now, don't get me wrong. Put it the other way around: the United States actually needs to make sure that member countries, along its first island chain of defense, should remain intact. And that is what the United States interests refers to. Now, but wait, there are several countries along the first island chain of defense, namely Korea, Japan, Taiwan, and the Philippines. But but wait a minute, before we go any further, remember that old question for almost every man: Now, if your mom and your wife fell into a river at the same time, who would you say first, and why? Now, mind you, both of them don't know how to swim. Now, what has this to do with our discussion about? Now, if you check back into history, there are the,、uh, the mutual defense treaty between the Republic of the Philippines and the United States of America, 1951; the、uh, Japan-U.S. Security Treaty, 1951; the U.S. Republic of Korea Mutual Defense Treaty, 1953; as well as the Taiwan Relations Act that was just talked about, 1979. So, in a way. If you try to translate all these into our question about, it would sound something like you promised to help the Philippines, Japan, Korea, and Taiwan, just about everyone along the island chain, and that means if they fell into a river, you would lend a helping hand to each and every one of them. Now, what if two, three, or even all four of them fell into the river at the same time? Could you still help? Can you even keep your promise? Now, now let's be practical. The answer is obviously a no. So you might argue that why would more than one be falling into the river? Simple. Now, if there is a military conflict between Taiwan and mainland China, what do you think Japan would do? According to a news report on Japan Times, a Chinese amphibious invasion of Taiwan would most likely be defeated by a U.S.-led coalition, but not without one key element: Japan's support. And that means they are going to be included. Now, and everyone knows how China defended North Korea during the Korean War. So this is the time for North Korea to pay back. And given the fact that North Korea considers Japan a foe all the Time it wouldn't mean more than two parties would be dragged into this thing, and if the U.S. is going to pressure South Korea into doing something to stop North Korea, okay, bingo, everyone is now in the water. <laughs> so which means the U.S. would be in a very embarrassing situation. And of course, the best solution is to maintain status quo in the Taiwan Straits, no matter how tense the situation might be. Nothing happens, and no one falls into the river. But wait, there is an issue. 
Do you remember the names Robert Kangan and Bill Crystal? Now these were prominent new conservative names. Now, and who is Robert Kangan's wife? Victoria Nolan. And, and who is she? Now she is currently serving as Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs. And did you know that Robert Kangan, who is also senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and the current Secretary of State's Antony Blinken, they published an article way back in 2019 titled "America First is Only Making the World Worse." Here is a better approach. Now, why would they want to dump America? First thing, that America first thing, it isn't simply because people like Antony Blinken, Victoria Nolan, and Robert Kagan are all neo conservatives who believe in the opposite. Well, America first, a term coined by former U.S. President Woodrow Wilson back in his 1916 campaign that pledged to keep America neutral in the First World War, generally emphasizes on nationalism and non-interventionism. Or in other words, do your own stuff. So in a way, it's sort of isolation. And here's you saw what Donald Trump did back then: withdraw from international treaties and organizations in his administration's foreign policy. And and it's also why some media critics back then have derided Trump's use of the America First policy as America alone. Now, but if you have all these new conservatives serving in the U.S. State Department, it is highly likely that the new conservatism is what they believe. So what are the basic pillars of new conservatism? First of all, internationalism. Now, according to Robert Kangan and Bill Crystal back in 2000, the first and the, the first and most basic tenet of new conservatism is a firm belief in the need for the United States to play an active role in the world. Now, the overarching goal of American foreign policy to preserve and extend an international order that is in accord with both the United States' material interests and principles and yours. Now, to Kangan and Bristol, Americans must shape this order, and if. The United States refrain from doing so. It can be sure that others will shape it in ways that reflect neither the United States' interests nor American values. Now you see why the United States has to block TikTok because it somehow changes the United States in a, in a cultural way. And hence, the danger here is not that America would do too much; it is that it would do too little. And, and to neocons, strategic overreach is never a problem, and retrenchment is not the solution. Now, this belief also leads them to advocate foreign interventions more. Willingly than realists, who have stricter standards for committing U.S. troops and are less prone to consider that you know America's credibility, interests, or ideals are at stake. Now, in this willingness to intervene, the neocons are close to some liberals, the ones who have been labeled liberal hulks, and who advocate humanitarian intervention to stop ethnic cleansing and genocides. Now, this convergence was first observed about the Balkans in the 1990s, when neocons and liberals jointly encouraged Bill Clinton to act decisively in Bosnia and Kosovo against the opinion of most realists, such as James Baker and Colin Powell. Now the second pillar of new conservatism is primacy, and this can be summarized by just a few favorite expressions. Now the first one, which is the indispensable nation. Now that one is used by the former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, or in Robert Kangan's word, the benevolent empire. So. Now Kangan argued that compared with past great powers, American hegemony was benign. So again, when Trump advocated America first, he also spelled the end of America as well's indispensable nation. Now no wonder why the neocons hate him so much. Now the third principle of new conservatism is unilateralism, which asserts that American power, not the United Nations Security Council, provides. Peace and security for the rest of the world, from protecting Taiwan, South Korea, and Israel to restoring peace in the Balkans, fighting Al Qaeda, or keeping sea lanes open. The United States therefore should not be restrained in its capacity to act neither by multilateral institution or by treaties, whether the International Criminal Court, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, treaties on biological weapons, or anti-personnel mines. The rogue states will not respect in any case. Now, in the new conservative vision, the United Nations is not only ineffective; it is also illegitimate, because it is profoundly undemocratic. What? Yes, the UN General Assembly gives as much power to Libya as to India, and the Security Council is even more flawed. Now, now, of course, that's from the United States' perspective, right? Now, using such American perspective, why should a tyranny? In quotes like China, and in quotes again, semi-dictatorship like Russia, hold veto power over what the international community does. Now, and hence the U.S. resorts to using force and military power, and hence militarism, the fourth pillar. And because of this, there is a tendency to inflate threats to national security either out of genuine concern or as a way to mobilize public opinion. Well, you need public opinion to support military operations, don't you? 
Now, the final one is democracy. And because America's origins and identity as a nation cannot be separated from democracy, it should not behave like other powers and can never remain indifferent to the nature of regimes and the fate of freedom and human rights. That conviction is not exclusive to the new conservatives and is shared with many on the left and not only the liberal hawks. That the Clinton administration, for example, put the enlargement of the democratic world at the center of the strategy, and in 2000, they established the community of democracies as an international forum to foster cooperation among democracies. But the particularity of new conservatives is to blend this conviction with muscular assertion of American power, so that in the long run, the new cons will no longer have to accommodate autocracies because they will plan for regime change, whether in the USSR, Soviet Union back then, Iraq, Iran, and of course, they need to do North Korea. So the doctrine of these people can be formulated as follows. The US should actively interfere in the politics of other countries, remove unwanted regimes, promote liberal democracy with all its might, and ensure its planetary hegemony by all possible means and fight against countries that challenge the value and military hegemony of the West. China, Russia, and smaller countries like Turkey, where sovereign and authoritarian tendencies are too strong. And of course, Israel must be guarded at all costs. So what do all these mean? Now, strategically speaking, it means that in order for the United States of America to maintain its hegemony and presuming that the new conservatives are running the State Department, well, we've seen the names there already, and the U.S. government knows just about everything, and mind you, over 300 conservative Republicans turned their backs on Trump and supported Joe Biden during his election campaign in 2020. So, the U.S. should want to see the containment, if not the fall, of like Russia and China. Oh, okay, I'm not saying the US is trying to, you know, wipe the other nations out of this planet. They can't. But making them weaker would absolutely be beneficial to the states. Now, in that regard, the Russia-Ukraine war is a good thing to the United States, as we're now expecting a much weaker Russia, at least in the next 30 years. Now, similarly, China, as long as it's being bugged by Taiwan issues and possibly a civil war, would be nice to the United States of America, as the US would no longer have to save anyone along the island chain. Oh, oh yes, yes, yes. So without Russia and China, the one that really is going to be isolated will be Iran. And did you not hear me say just a while ago that Israel must be guarded at all costs? Hey, Benjamin Nanya, who is back? He is a new con. So, until then, ciao! Before you leave, please be sure to like, subscribe, hit that notification bell, and share this with your friends. See you in the next episode!